Okay, so uh, back a little bit to text processing. We're going to speak about uh, lexical semantics a little bit. It's a uh, I could take the risk and say it's the hottest topic now in terms of what NLP tasks you perform because it's a task that interacts very well with the new trends in machine learning and deep learning. Um, so let's let's uh, flesh it out a little bit from the beginning. Uh, so what is it about? This is a quote by James Pustelyovsky. Uh, I, I think it's very nice to, to start a presentation on semantics. What is it about the representation of a lexical item that gives rise to sense extensions and to the phenomenon of logical polysemy? So what is there behind meaning of words, the interaction between these meanings, and how, as uh, researchers in NLP, are we going or are uh, uh, developing systems that, that you know, account for these phenomena. Um, so lexical semantics is a discipline about understanding the units of meaning of the language, uh, not necessarily words, but also compounds, phrases, affixes. So any unit that you may want to encode language uh, as. And in NLP, we have gone a, a very long way from the, the original formal logic way of representing semantics into path-based uh, and now distributional semantics, which is what we are going to, to talk a little bit about now. Uh, it also intersects with relational semantics, so when you are evaluating a system that on, on um, um, identifying the meaning of a word, intrinsically you are also putting that word in context with the other words in, 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 in your vocabulary. Um, and uh, the, the intuition of uh, distributional semantics is based uh, on, on, a, on an assumption that we all believe it holds, which is that you should know a word by the company it keeps. Mm? So, and uh, this is a classic example, right? So I don't know if anybody here knows what a Wompi Womp map is. No? No, no. But if I put the word in context, maybe it can uh, bring a bell. No? So he fills the Wompi monk with the substance, pass it around, and we all drank some. And so I'm pretty sure now most of you already have a broad idea of what this is. But actually, if I take the word Wompi monk and I say that we found a little hairy Wompi monk sleeping behind the tree, now the meaning that you're the, the meaning you're assigning to that word has probably changed uh, quite a bit. No? So in fact, Wompi monk doesn't exist. It's a made-up word by McDonald and Bramstar uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a long ago, and, we, to, and they use this to illustrate how much we rely on context to understand the meaning of words. Um, and this is the distributional, uh, the distributional hypothesis. Words that appear in similar contexts exhibit similar semantics. So with this uh, assumption, uh, this assumption is what has given a rise to all the, 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 the work on uh, continuous vertical representations and word embeddings uh, <coughs> because of the following. So in distributional semantics, as I said at the beginning, um, you would traditionally compute word a context concurrency matrix matrices, and you take a word and I look for context, I define what a context is for me, and I uh, uh, this, uh, what, uh, encode these occurrences for isolated words with potentially occurring context. The problem with this is that you are uh, have to use a very long vocabulary because the vocabulary in, that, in the language is very long, and if you encode one one dimension per word in the vocabulary, you are inferring the sparsity, and also um, when you are building co a concurrence matrix and you're encoding the context. Uh, the word context coherence, uh, for example, for dogs, you are not implicitly you're not uh, you're missing a lot of information uh, from cats or other animals because you're looking at explicit appearances of the word and its context. So this is uh, this has changed uh, with uh, the the predictive what Baronian colleagues call a predictive model. So instead of counting, predicting words by a context. This small change, this small change, made uh, the representation of text as vectors 
very similar to other uh, type of media or other type of data whose nature uh, kind of forces you to encode them in real value uh, dense vectors like, like audio or images. By predicting words using the context, uh, when you are modeling the vector of a cat, you are also extracting uh, inherent characteristics of other uh, types, of other words that share similar contexts. And this is a uh, projection, these are uh, visualizations of, from word to vec uh, vectors, uh, uh, it's a very famous uh, algorithm for building uh, word embeddings. And they come from the TensorFlow website tutorial on, on, on word embeddings, highly recommend it. Um, and as you can see, because the context, the context of, the, of the embeddings are similar, there are certain semantic properties that emerge in your data, even if you don't have to define them a priori. Now, so in the first uh, um, male-female relation appears on the left, so you see that the vector, that the vector difference between king and queen is very similar as the man and uh, woman, or other relations like the verb tense or country capital, you name it. And I think that the coolest thing about this is that you're not telling the model to learn this, this is emerging from your data. So as long as you have enough data, <coughs> you may be able to see stuff in how people uh, write that you may not even, may, may not have thought about uh, earlier. No? And it, how, how this translates into code, well, there's, uh, well, everybody uh, that uh, does data science with, with text at some point has uh, important genesis because uh, it's, uh, it has a, a Python implementation of the original word to uh, algorithm. And so, okay, let's go back a little bit to lexical semantics. So in semantics, you have a system that needs to learn the meaning of words. And how do you evaluate that? So there are different tasks for evaluating how well a system knows uh, how, uh, uh, how to assign uh, what meaning to words, right? So this can be, for example, done, done in the TOEFL uh, test, in the English test, where you have synonymic questions and distractors. So as a student, you go and you're given an English test, and you say, this is a synonym, this is a synonym of this, and these two are not synonyms. So a system, uh, a distributional semantic system, is uh, traditionally uh, evaluated on the, same, on the same exams. Also, um, um, this uh, semantic data sets, uh, pair of words, uh, look for hyperlinks. So tell me which of these pairs of words are, is, are types of, so any cat, animal, cat, uh, hammer, and so on. I mean, my system needs to say <coughs> the first one in codes and is a relation, but the second one is unrelated. And also analogy. And there are data sets where you have to kind of solve the equation of A, B, A is to B as C is to X, where X is what your algorithm has to discover. And um, with word embeddings, this was a lot of the news because it was very cool to see that, oh, if you could say, if you take the vector of man and uh, of the vector of king and subtract the vector of man and then add the vector of woman, then you the closest, the nearest neighbor to that resulting vector is queen. So you can actually solve analogy tasks in an unsupervised way. This means that you don't need training data. Uh, and uh, for uh, and it's also very simple to, to, to exploit. You can see it's one line of code. And this, is, this form, uh, answers the analogy question. Man is to king as woman is to queen. No? So this is everybody more or less who works in NLP has seen this a uh, few times. So how does this translate into music information retrieval? Without any supervision, you can play with your data to look for representative instruments. And this is, uh, the examples I'm going to give you now are by querying a model which is already pre-trained in the world to web uh, webpage, uh, trained on Google, on I think one million Google News web documents, but it's not music specific, I mean, it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's generic. Even, uh, so if you want to solve Hendrix is to guitar, Mozart is to edge, uh, the, the nearest neighbors to that, to that uh, uh, vector is piano, it's accordion, so it's kind of it's, it's nice. Uh, you can look for associated music genres, for example, another thing that, that came up to mind. So Enrique Iglesias is to pop, as Elvis Presley is to, and the output it was country and reggae the first two. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, country, rock, and then reggae. Of course, reggae doesn't make any sense, but at least it's a music genre. So there is some kind of semantic property that is being uh, preserved. Um, so 
in the in the website of the of the tutorial, you can download a word of model trained only on music uh, data, only on music texts with uh, uh, it's, it's more than 16,000 group uh, uh, biographies, last ten days, and some five uh, uh, documents. And yeah, so now there is a lot of work. There has been a lot of work, especially since 2014, so for the last two years or so, in how to enhance these um, these uh, word embedding models, how to make them more sensitive, how to, how to make them semantic, and also how to make them domain specific uh, sensitive. And this is one of the examples because we were working with already with with information that was already uh, in the music domain. Musical entities were already tokenized, so Mick Jagger is not the vector of is not the centroid of the vector of, of Mick and the vector of Jagger, but it's actually one single entity, so it has its own vector. So it's easier to uh, ex ex explore the data you have. So it's more or less the same thing. So John Lennon is to Beatles as Mick Jagger is to Rolling Stones, or something a little bit more uh, convoluted, I would say. Lady Gaga is to dance pop as CC Dog is to jazz rock. So with music music data, you can actually query these things. Another thing that I found very nice is that if you take the centroid of Roger Moore and see Barrett, the nearest neighbor was another Pink Floyd member. I thought that was very cool. And also the, the, the closest to Iggy Pop is, is Patty Smith, so it seems to make sense. Of course, I'm giving you the juiciest examples. I mean, I, I went into a, 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 I'm not giving you all the times where I had an idea and I was like, oh, this is important. But uh, yeah, it's a matter of exploring your data and see, uh, again, this is unsupervised. You are not pre-labeling anything and you are seeing what kind of regularities are emerging in your data by, by doing this. Um, so, yes. So for the cases where it doesn't work, do you think it's a problem of the, of the model or of the lack of, lack of data? Um, well, first, it's, it's a problem of lack of experimentation by our side because uh, um, it's worth to try all different parameters that the work of the algorithm has. So you can play with the window, with the context window. We can, you can, uh, it has, it's not one single algorithm, so you have continuous back of force, a still ground model. Then whether you want to use negative something, so you want to actually uh, give a lot of relevance to negative cases and introduce artificial neg negative cases. And we haven't done this. So this would be, if you ask me, the first uh, thing to do is play more with the model with that data. Uh, and of course, in data science, get more data and it's probably better. Mm. Um, okay, so what things can you do using uh, this kind of, of embeddings in the music domain? And uh, this is something that I've been working on quite a bit, which is doing words and disambiguation and entity linking, but instead of using off the shelf tools, uh, attempting this task uh, using vectors. So let's say, for example, you have the following sentence. The influence of Sisters of Mercy became evident in later poetry. Hmm? Sisters of Mercy could be Leonard Cohen's song, but it could also be Las Hermanitas de la Caridad, no? the, the, the religious order. So, and, and here, at first glance, I don't have too much information about which of them I should uh, uh, choose other than poetry. And even maybe there was a lot of cultural and literal, uh, literary production from, from, uh, from the Sisters of Mercy, who knows. The thing is that at least I have one pivot word that I can use to uh, attempt the disambiguation of that ending. And, and we have done, uh, so we have not uh, uh, published anything on how well the, the disambiguation works using vectors as opposed to of the <coughs> tools in, for entity linking, but they are always being a part of longer pipelines. Uh, but we, are, we were very happy with the end results, so implicitly I would say it, it, it's at least worth trying. Uh, we used uh, for this task, sense level embeddings, uh, which are mapped to Babelnet. So you already know that Babelnet is a large semantic network where you have concepts from, from WordNet like hope, shoe, uh, or summer, and named entities like uh, uh, Mick Jagger, The Beatles, Barcelona, The Cloud Metro Station, you name know, it, you, whatever you have in media. Now, uh, these vectors, which, which were uh, presented specifically, we used sense embed, it was uh, presented in, in ACL. 
2015. And the, the beauty of these vectors is that you have, for example, the vector of bank. But bank will have <coughs> as closest neighbors things like financial finance, money, transactions, things related to the sense of financial institution, but also uh, river, nature, water, also vectors with, uh, which are related to the uh, name, to the river bank sense. So in this, uh, in, in this model, since they are disambiguated vectors, the clusters are very clearly separated between the two senses. So we use this with, uh, to perform a disambiguation strategy, which is the following. You take your two candidates and you assume that the closest, uh, the closest two senses in the vector space from all the available senses associated to each uh, appearance, that would be Sisters of Mercy and Poetry, are going to be the uh, most likely disambiguation, the most likely senses for those. So this uh, intuition may work, for example, in relation extraction. If you have uh, Neil uh, Armstrong won Tour de France, Armstrong may be the saxophonist, may be the, 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 the cyclist, or maybe uh, some other guy famous guy named Armstrong. The thing is that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and, uh, but Tour de France, which vector of Tour de France is going to be, which sense of answer is going to be closer to Tour de France? The one with the, with the, with the sports sense. No? So this was more or less our intuition. Uh, so you keep the two vectors from each set that maximizes the cosine similarity of them. And you keep the two of them that are the closest. This translates up to go as, as this. We wrote a small interface with to sense and bear, so you could like, get level senses. I, I'm not as adventurous as him, so I'm not using any notebook. You have to trust me, this works. Uh, so you get the level senses, then you get the poetry senses, and then you go closest senses. And uh, if, if your intuition is okay, then you expect the disambiguation to be to be correct. And I tried this uh, uh, yesterday, and that, yeah, again, you have to trust me, but the, the sense. The Babelnet ID, so this ID here, you can actually go to babelnet.org and, and, and check it out. It was actually the, the result uh, that we were expecting. So we had the sense of Sisters of Mercy as the Leonard uh, Cohen. So. so we thought this was a very nice application of using word embeddings for disambiguation. And since we are speaking about music, you can always disambiguate against the music sense. So, uh, lexical semantics. Good password in NLP again because it interacts very well with the with the the word embeddings. Uh, it's not fashion anymore; it's a uh, the word embeddings uh, scenario. And vector space models, lexical semantics, and classic neural approaches. Well, clearly, you know, about the Dawei and the area of research. In fact, it was a uh, it was kind of uh, of uh, jokingly, but it was very. Uh, um, illustrative. EMNLP is a conference, it's a very strong conference in NLP. It's called the Empirical Methods in Natural Language Processing, but I read a blog post about the guy that attended there that said that the entire joke in this one was that the e -E EMNLP now stands for embedding instead of empirical. So you can see that this is already, this is clearly something that everybody is willing to, to work in because it's giving very good results in pretty much every, every task combined with deep learning. And these are the references. 